It was the summer of 81, and I had been the paperboy for the cul-de-sac that I lived on for about two years at that point. I had gotten into a really solid routine for myself, and always made sure that I was out of the front door on my bike by 3.15 in the morning, so that I could pick up the papers by 3.30 and start my route. I only had to deliver papers to six roads with houses on them, one of which was my own. In total, on a good day, it took me about an hour and a half to two hours to get that done. If I finished early enough, I got to help out around the office for a bit and do things like file paperwork and set up the coffee for the morning shift. That morning was a particularly hot and humid one, so I intended on doing my route as fast as I possibly could. That way I could spend some time in the air-conditioned office. I admit that I had been rushing that day, so I wasn't aware of my surroundings. But about halfway through my route, I couldn't help but shake the feeling that I was getting followed. I kept seeing the same car pass me as I made my way through my route, but I really didn't think anything of it at the moment. That was until I was preparing to make a left turn onto the road next to mine, and I felt the back tire of my bike get slammed by something. My bike flew out from underneath me, and I was thrown to the ground. That was when I noticed the car that hit me. It was the same car that I had seen multiple times that morning. I was in a daze after hitting my head on the pavement and couldn't do much to fight back as a man emerged from the driver's side of the car, picked me up, and dragged me into the back seat. He proceeded to close the door and then got back into the driver's seat. I attempted to sit up and open the door, but there was no handle attached to the door of the back seat. I was trapped. We drove in the car for about two hours before he pulled us onto a long, dirt road, which led us to an old baby blue single-story house. I was in and out of consciousness for most of the ride, but every chance I got, I banged and pleaded for the man to set me free. He didn't say much to me during the trip, aside from telling me to relax and that everything was going to be fine. My captor threw the car into park and proceeded to get out and pull me from the back seat. As soon as my feet hit the pavement, I did everything I could do to fight back. Sadly, the man was much larger than I was, and he easily overpowered me. I fought my hardest, but he still managed to drag me over to his home. And once inside, he walked me down a dimly lit hallway to a door that led downstairs. I guess he had grown impatient by then, because instead of walking me down, he shoved me and sent me flying down the stairs. He didn't follow me down right away, so I took a second to look around for anything that I might have been able to use as a weapon. I could hear him walking around upstairs as the floorboard above my head creaked and shifted under his weight. After a moment or so, the man threw the basement door open and came down the stairs. Only now, he had a camera in his hands pointed right at me. That's it, he said. I have someone that is going to pay good money for you. Give me a smile, he asked. I just stood there frozen. But once again, he grew impatient and screamed, Smile! This time I listened to what he told me. After having me stand in front of the camera for a bit longer, the man who abducted me left me and went upstairs. I winced as I heard the sound of the basement door locking from the other side. The first night I was in the basement, I used all of my energy trying to figure out a way to escape. There was no way though. Every time I went up the stairs toward the door, it was like he knew. He would begin yelling down at me that trying to leave was pointless. I was in the basement for four days before I saw him again. That was when it was time to sell me. He descended the stairs with rope in his hand. I tried to overpower him as he tied my hands together, but there was no use. In no time at all, I was back in the car with no handles to help me escape. It was an hour's drive from the man's house to the meeting point where I was supposed to be sold to someone. But when we pulled up to the parking lot of the hiking trail where we were supposed to be meeting the other man at, there was a squadron of police cars waiting for us. According to the officers, 
They had been trying to set up the man who had kidnapped me for nearly six years. They had to use an undercover officer to make contact with him as a potential buyer. After arresting the man, I was driven to the police station where my parents had been called and waiting for me. According to the officers, after searching the man's home, they found tapes that made them think he had done this to at least six kids across the United States. It was two weeks before my 10th birthday, and my mother had taken me to the mall so that she could run some errands and I could look around for a toy that I wanted for my birthday. As she was getting her hair done, I anxiously waited for the moment that I could run across the mall to the toy store and look through their section of Transformer action figures. I really wanted to get Starscream that year. Finally, my time came. My mother told me that she had to run into the shoe store really fast, but since it was right next to the toy store, I could go in ahead of her and look around. I wasted no time at all, and I ran into the toy store and began walking around the aisles until I came across the one that had all of the Transformer and Power Rangers. I looked around and picked up as many toys as my little hands could handle, and I made sure to push all of the Try Me buttons that were in sight. And sure enough, after looking around, I finally found the star scream that I wanted. My mom hadn't come into the store yet, and I couldn't wait to tell her. So I ran out of the toy store and right into the shoe store in hopes that she would come and look at the toy with me. I began walking around the shoe store and after a while realized that I couldn't find my mom. I tried not to panic and walked out of the store, but sadly, I walked right into a sea of people who were all shopping. I quickly became overwhelmed and I began to look around frantically for my mother. That was when a woman noticed me and came over to see if I was all right. After telling her that I couldn't find my mom, she offered to walk me to the mall security desk so that she could help me. For some reason, I felt safe and agreed to her offer. She grabbed my hand and began walking me through the mall. Only she wasn't walking me to the security desk. In fact, after about a minute of walking, I realized that we were almost outside. I began trying to pull away from her, but her grip tightened around my hand. She managed to get me through the mall doors and into the parking lot where I saw a man standing outside of an old olive colored car. I immediately began to scream as I tried harder and harder to pull away from the woman. <coughs> and at that point, I had caught some people's attention. I screamed at the top of my lungs and eventually someone yelled out from the sidewalk for us to hold on a minute. This interaction must have scared the woman because she let go of my wrist right away before running over to her car. I turned to the sidewalk, and to my surprise, I saw my mother running out of the doors to the mall in a panic. We made eye contact, and I ran over to her with tears running down my face. The car peeled out of the parking lot and sped away. We made a statement to the police and the mall security, but to our knowledge, the two people haven't been caught. It was the middle of my senior year of high school. I had just gotten a job at the local Taco Shack, a small restaurant that served Spanish and Mexican food. It was only my second week working there, but it was my first night closing. That meant that after the owner and the cooks left, I had to clean and then lock the store up before heading home. Now, I only lived about half a mile away from the taco shack, so I would walk home. That night, I cleaned everything in the restaurant, locked up, and then began heading out of the parking lot. That was when I noticed an old sedan that was still sitting in the parking lot. I tried to see if there was anyone inside as I continued to make my way toward the road, but it was too dark, so I couldn't get a good enough look. I began making my way down the road. But it wasn't long before I realized that the car had pulled out of the parking lot and now was following me closely. I thought about running, but I didn't want to seem paranoid. So I just continued walking as everything was fine. Sadly, everything was far from fine. The car quickly accelerated and pulled itself right in front of me so that I couldn't continue walking. And before I could turn around to run, Two men jumped out of the passenger side and rushed me. I was thrown to the ground and then was overcome with a hail of punches and kicks until eventually I blacked out. By the time I came to, 
I realized my arms had been tied behind my back and I had been locked inside someone's trunk. I wiggled around and did everything I could to break my arms free, but there was no use. I was trapped in the darkness of a trunk for one I can only presume was two to three hours as the car drove along. I remember that the road got really bumpy after a while. That must have been when we pulled off the main road and onto a dirt trail. After driving down the bumpy road for a couple of minutes, the car finally came to a stop and I could hear the men up front getting out. I heard them approach the trunk. I wasn't sure what to expect when it opened. As soon as they popped the trunk, I saw three men standing on the outside of it, one of them holding a hunting rifle in my face. You can get out now, he said as one of his companions began to pull me out of the trunk. He cut the bindings on my hands and then pushed me backward. The man with the rifle then lifted it into the air and said, you have 10 minutes to run. I hesitated because I wasn't sure how to respond. That was when the man fired a single shot into the sky and yelled, run. I didn't hesitate anymore. I took off running into the forest as fast as I could. I wanted to stay on the trail that the car had driven up, but my gut was telling me that I'd be safe in the cover of the trees. I ran for hours, still unsure how close my pursuers were from catching up to me. I couldn't be sure, but every time I stopped to catch my breath, I could swear that I hear twigs snapping around me. Every step I took, I was worried that I was going to hear sound of a gunshot. Hours passed, and eventually, I could see the sun coming up from the tree line. Still unsure where my captors were, I continued to run. Eventually, I began hearing the sound of slowly moving water, and I began heading toward what turned out to be a stream. I'm not typically religious, but something must have been looking out for me that morning because to my surprise, there was a father and his son fishing in the stream, right across from where I emerged from the tree line. I flagged them down, and as I fell to the ground from exhaustion, the father came rushing over to me to help me and called out for his son to get his phone. They called an ambulance and then helped me back to their truck. After hearing my story, the hospital called the police to whom I gave my statement. That was my last day working at Taco Shack, and I have a hard time walking home after dark. All I keep telling myself is that things could have turned out a lot worse. Hello all, fairly new to Reddit and just discovered this forum, so please feel free to delete this if it doesn't fit the criteria. And also, this might be a little long, so I apologize, but I've never written this out before and never will again, so I figured I might as well tell the whole thing for myself, if no one else. This is the only creepy slash scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life which is probably why it stands out so much in my memory. In hindsight, the location and general isolation probably made it seem much scarier than it was, but at the time it felt like I would stumbled into the opening scenes of a full-on horror film. Anyway, here's the story. Just over ten years ago, I was fresh out of college, and I moved back to my parents' house for the free rent and food for nine months or so, before I was leaving the state for graduate school. Now my parents are super chill, and gave me my own space in the house, but being a 22-year-old single guy and living in a house in the sticks, they had just recently moved about 40 miles south of a major Midwest city, is certainly not ideal. I didn't have any other options, so I started looking for some work, more to pass the time than to save up some money. Summer turned to winter, and I still hadn't found anything solid but by then I was desperately needing to spend more of my time out of my parents' house, so I took a part-time gig doing some light bookkeeping for a small business owner that my dad knew. I didn't really want to do it since it didn't pay much, was short-term, and wasn't even a real office setup, but again, since my parents lived in the middle of nowhere Midwest, I knew I had limited local opportunities to make cash, and this guy was going to pay me under the table as well. About that same time, a friend of mine in the city said that if I just paid him $200 a month and helped clean up, he'd basically let me crash in his living room until I was ready to move out of state. That was all I needed to hear. I took the job. So my dad's friend's family had a construction-type business. 
They helped out with building stuff a little, but it was ultimately more focused on renting out a few bobcats and large augers they owned, also other various drills, and then odds and ends like generators and other low-level construction or farming equipment that someone in that area couldn't afford to purchase but might need to use from time to time. This was a pretty small mom-and-pop type thing, where everyone knew everyone and the office only opened on days when someone was coming by. It was generally just a mutually beneficial situation for the business owners and the locals. Since I had minored in a business adjacent area, and my dad recommended me, they trusted me to go in there for about 15 to 20 hours a week and check and file the rental forms. Make sure nobody missed a payment date if there was a payment plan in place, or answer an email or two discussing the prices and availability. A super easy gig. The old building where I worked was about, I think, 90 years old, and at the top of this little hill. The downstairs used to be an old country bar until the 1970s when this family bought it cheap, cleared out the bar, and fenced in the property to use its parking lot area to store all their rental equipment and gear. I could generally come and go as I pleased, work any hours I wanted to as long as the work got done, and so if things were slow and there weren't any rentals for a couple of days... I'd usually go in after 7 and stay until around midnight or 1. I knew I'd be alone and could listen to music loud and take my time and all that. The office where I worked was on the second floor of the building above the old bar and looked out onto the long driveway. From my seat, I could easily see out the window and once or twice I saw a family of deer or a raccoon scamper by. I always glanced out when I saw movement since it was very noticeable. It was incredibly remote, very still and quiet, so if something unusual occurred or if something felt off, I definitely noticed it. One night during winter, it had snowed a few inches, and my dad told me to stay in because the roads were bad. I had an old SUV, and more than that, just really wanted to get out of the house, so I went into work at about 8pm and was going to stay until just after 1. I always left the gate open at the bottom of the hill, since believe me when I say that nobody ever showed up at night, since we were literally in the middle of nowhere. I think the nearest occupied house was about two miles down the road, and to even turn onto our short road you had to only be coming to our specific building, and no one was there beforehand. It was a locals only type thing, and very small since the family had inherited a lot of money and did this kind of rental thing on the side. Basically, someone would never just get lost and end up at our building. So I'm jamming away to some Fallout Boy, everyone makes mistakes when they're young, and having some coffee, and kept glancing at the snow outside the window here and there. Our orangish streetlight reflected onto the ground at the gate, and was causing the light to shine off the snow in a really cool, and dare I say pretty way. At one point around midnight, I went downstairs to the big bathroom to do my bathroom business, and then came back upstairs and got settled back into my work. I probably did about five minutes of work, when I glanced outside and saw a huge imprint of something in the fresh snow just below the light. It seemed like it must have been a huge dog, or substantial animal had just rolled around on the ground there on its back or something. Since I didn't notice it just fifteen minutes before, it had to have happened while I was in the bathroom, or maybe when my back was turned, since I would have seen that type of movement for sure. I shook it off and assumed a dog, or maybe even a farm animal, had gotten loose, and maybe was attracted to the light or something. Who knows? At around two in the morning, I was leaving, and as always, I got out of my car to lock the gate up. To be honest, I had pretty much forgotten about the imprint in the snow, but when I looked down, I was shocked to see that it wasn't just some disturbed snow, but was undeniably the imprint of a human-made snow angel. If you don't know what a snow angel is, it's when people lie on their back in the snow and push their arms and legs back and forth so they get up and it looks like the outline of an angel. I used to do this when I was a kid, so I 100% knew for sure that's what it was. It was deliberately made underneath the light post but it wasn't from a kid. It must have been a very large person, or at least a normal-sized adult wearing tons of layers of big winter clothing. 
I looked up and saw what I already knew, that whoever had made this snow angel could easily look up and have seen me through that window, so they must have waited for me to head downstairs to make this angel. I definitely would have seen or heard if someone drove up to our building, even if I was in the bathroom, so I knew someone had to have walked deep into the freezing cold and snow for a few miles, stopped in front of our building, and then did a snow angel in the small amount of time I wasn't sitting in front of my desk window. I glanced around for tracks in the snow, and I saw that there was one set that led to the nearby woods to the right of the building. It was clear that the person hadn't used the road, but had instead come from the opposite side, which made me instantly uneasy. That side was just trees and darkness for miles and miles. I was definitely a little freaked out now once I realized that someone had just been this close to me secretly in the middle of the woods, and I looked around but didn't see anything amiss at all. Now I just wanted to get the hell out of there. When I got back in my car and drove a few feet, I realized that my boss would be there in about four hours and might see the snow angel assume I did it since he probably assumed I kept the gate locked when I was there. It wouldn't have been that big an issue at all, but I was young and felt like I might be made fun of by him if nothing else. They were all manly men and I liked books. So I opened the gate back up real quick, ran over and kicked the snow around to hide the angel and locked it up again and went back to my car. I almost lied here and said something else since it might seem fake. I assume the average person wouldn't get back out of their SUV and not just flee in their car because they'd be embarrassed about a snow angel. But at that time I was very insecure and cared a lot about what others thought, so unfortunately that's what I did. Also, I wasn't exactly fully terrified at this point, even though it was certainly unsettling. I just thought it was really weird and could have maybe been an illegal hunter. Either way, the imprint was made two hours earlier, and I assumed by this point they were long gone. But that's when I heard it. When I was getting into my SUV, there was the loudest high-pitched laughing coming from deep in the woods. It almost sounded like a fake laugh, like the witch in The Wizard of Oz or something, like someone was doing it fake on purpose to show they weren't scared of me or to see how I'd react at all once I knew they were laughing at me on our property. It was close enough that I knew they could see me, but I couldn't see them at all since other than the street light I was under, there was no illumination. After a few seconds of the laughing, they stopped, and then it was just silence everywhere except for the beating of my heart through my ears. Then the laughing started again, though louder this time, more like screaming than laughing. I sort of froze for like five seconds, listening in panic. I spent a lot of time in that area, and I know what coyotes and foxes sound like at night with their high-pitched screeches during mating season, so I can't completely logically ruin that out. But honestly, it felt like it was an adult man trying to emulate a woman, like someone was deliberately trying to make a fake scary shriek in order to scare someone. Well, it worked. After that five seconds, I was immediately filled with adrenaline. I got in my car and drove the hell away from there as fast as I could, without sliding off the road. Back at home, I was up all night trying to figure it out, and told my parents the story when they woke up. After talking it out, we decided it was one of two things. It was either of my brain somehow convincing itself that the snow formation was angel-shaped, and it was really just caused by an animal and then the snow tracks and laughing had just come from a coyote or red fox, though I don't think that's what it was. What I truly believe, the second thing, is that some person was out walking around for some reason and had decided to fuck with me. I didn't have any close friends left in that area that would do this, and if they did, they would certainly have brought it up to make fun of me for speeding away in terror. I found out later that the nearest house on that side was a very old couple, so I highly doubt it was one of them, which means whoever it was went out in the woods in the night in the freezing cold just to mess with the stranger. I don't have any mental issues or family history of them. Didn't do drugs. I drank socially sometimes at the time, but certainly hadn't that night. I also don't believe in the paranormal, so I never once gave that a thought. 
I knew in my heart that someone was out there. I worked there another six weeks or so and never had a single issue, though I knew where my boss kept his gun, and I always made sure it was there when I started my shift. I certainly always locked the gate from then on. Thinking about this experience that night, the part that freaked me out the most was that he had to have waited around for me to leave for about two hours just for him to do that laugh. He didn't know me. I could have been crazy and the type of person to get mad and try to find and attack him. Yet he didn't seem scared at all or to care when he tried to mess with me. For some random person out there, this is probably a story he tells from his point of view to make all of his friends giggle hysterically. But for me, that dude, the one I call Angel and the Snow Guy, the one with the laugh I'll never forget. Let's never meet. I was ten. Every summer for the nine years prior, I had spent at least one week at my grandmother's house in Maryland. It was a place where everyone knew everyone. A stark contrast to my South Florida home, where I barely knew the neighbors who were one house away. My grandmother could tell me the names of her neighbors, their kids, and even what grades they were in. They all knew and loved her, and so they looked after her. On this summer day, we were playing cards, as we often did, at her wooden dining room table. She lived in a red brick house that had a crawl space under it, so it was slightly elevated off the ground. One of the things I loved most about being at her house was the way that she would wake up every morning and open all the blinds to let the natural light shine in. As soon as the sun would set, she would close the blinds and we would retreat into the comfort of the lamp-lit, green shag-rugged living room to watch the evening news. This day, however... We started playing cards while the sun was still up, and being wrapped up in the game, well until after the sun had set. The phone suddenly rang, interrupting our focus. I jumped up, excited to answer. Hello? I didn't recognize the voice on the other line. All I could identify was the urgency in their pitch. Uh, yes, can I speak with Mrs. C, please? Yeah, hold on. Grandma, it's for you. Who else would it have been for? She was the only one who had lived in that house for the last 12 years, since my grandpa had passed away. I sat at the kitchen table, closer to the pantry, where she kept her phone, and watched her with eager, curious eyes. I waited for her to tell me who was on the line, or for a hint in the conversation that might give it away. But she didn't tell me. In fact, the only thing she said before she hung up was, Oh my. Okay, thank you. What could this be about? Granny, who was that? She wasn't paying attention to me. It was like I wasn't even in the room for her anymore. Grandma, who was it? What's wrong? What's going on? The urgency had transferred from the caller through my voice and into her eyes. Her face twisted as she picked the phone up, this time to call the police. I grew worried, scared. The world felt like it was dissolving around me, but I didn't know how or why. I didn't even know it was the police she was calling. I just had to listen to her half of the conversation to try and figure out what was even going on. Hi, yes. Can you send someone to my house on Elmbrook Drive? I have reason to believe there's a trespasser on my property. I strained to hear the response of the person on the other line, but all I could hear was my grandmother's now labored breathing. Okay, thank you. Again, she hung up the phone. By this time, I had started crying, feeling panicked. Again, my questions went unanswered, as she picked up the phone to call her next-door neighbor. Hi, sorry to bother you. It's Ola. Can you come over? Uh, please bring your... She looked up and saw me as she closed the door. I could no longer hear what she was saying, 
but I distinctly heard the word gun. Things were getting real and fast. A minute later, she emerged to address me. Sweetheart, let's go to the bedroom. I need to meet Mr. R for a minute, and I just want you to stay in there until I tell you to come out, okay? What's wrong, Grandma? Why did you call the police? It came out in fractured segments as I caught my breath from all the crying. I'll explain everything soon enough. I sat in the bedroom and looked through the blinds to watch for the neighbor. A weak flashlight appeared in the yard from the left. It bounced up and down with each of his steps. Next to the flashlight, I could see the barrel of a shotgun, something I had only ever seen a handful of times, each one equally terrifying. The light bounced past the front door and beyond the garage where he faded away from sight. A few painstaking minutes later, he was back at the front door and knocking. I heard my grandma let him in, muffled voices back and forth. She came and let me out of the room then. I still had no idea what was happening. My stomach was in my throat, my head pounding from the scared tears I couldn't stop shedding. I sat on the couch as the neighbor explained to my grandma that he would stay with us until the police had arrived, but that he believed that we were now in the clear. As I looked around, I noticed that the once open blinds had been hastily and haphazardly closed. Moments later, the police arrived. Like the neighbor, they walked to the back of the house with their lights and guns in hand. And when she spoke to them, I only heard bits and pieces. We were playing cards. The neighbor from across the way called on the phone. Watching us through the window. Called you. And the police explained that the property was clear, but took us outside to show us where the man had left footprints in the mud from the back gate leading up to and away from the window that sat at the end of the dining room table. There had been a man in the window watching us as we played cards. The neighbor to the back and across the soccer field had looked out their window to see the shadowed and hooded figure, backlit by the light from our open blinds. He had climbed atop a toolbox and sat below the window, just getting a clear sight of us. What he was planning... I'll never know. He must have been spooked by the phone call or a disruption in our game. I'll always be grateful for that neighbor who called. A neighbor that I never met. So I've never posted to this subreddit, so please forgive me for any formatting errors or whatever. Just a bit of context. Now, I went to a small liberal arts college that had on-campus houses in addition to dorms. Now, I was an RA, resident assistant, for a grouping of houses. Now, I was in charge of a large house that had a lot of people. This happened in February of 2017. So in my junior year of college, I find a camera in my room. I had just returned home from dance rehearsal, so I took a shower, changed, fixed a poster, and watched some vines. As I'm getting ready for bed, I pick out a hair bow I wanted to wear the next day. Well, among all the hair bows, I spot a small black box. My first thought is that it's one of those funky little ant traps that the maintenance guy left there, which would be weird because I was an RA of that particular building and should have known about any maintenance. I picked it up, and it had a bit of tape on it. I peeled back the tape to reveal a red light. Well, fuck. I flip it over and find some words. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it had the make and model of the camera. At that moment, I realized what it is, and my heart drops. I run down the hall to my two good friends' room and show them we find there's an SD card still left in the camera. We want to look on it, but none of our laptops have an SD card reader. No biggie. My friend works at the library and says she'll rent a reader from them. Next day, I come home from classes and take a peek at what my friends have found. Footage of me and several other girls in assorted buildings and rooms. 
There was no compromising footage of me, for which I'm very thankful, but there was footage from some other girls of the building peeing, brushing their teeth, and all sorts of other stuff. I didn't see all the footage, so I don't know exactly what else was on there. They then show me footage of the person hiding the camera. Yeah, you read that right. The person who hid the camera recorded themselves doing it, and I recognized them. They were another RA on the same staff team as me. At this point, I'm freaking out. I call our boss, who's doing interviews for next year's RAs, and go, Dude, I have to talk to you right now. I tell him the situation, and he seems pretty calm. Says he'll take care of it, but he needs me to come to his office later that night. And I say okay. The next part of that day was excruciating. I had to go to a dinner meeting for a campus organization I was president of. I was worried the person might come back and take their camera while I was gone. So I grabbed it and took it with me. My freshman year roommate was there with me, and on the drive home she asked me what was wrong. I told her and showed her the camera. As we were sitting in the parking lot, someone is walking towards my building. Who should it be but the fucker who hid a camera in my room? At this point I'm having a full-on panic attack. My friend says she'll cover for me. She'll watch the house while I get out of there. I just book it away as fast as I can. I hid in another building, until she let me know that he was gone and away. At this point, I meet with my boss. I tell him what happened, and he looks at the footage with his boss. I answer questions for campus security. Then, I answer questions for the city police. My boss and I go back to my house to make sure there were no other cameras. They take the guy in question and put him in a detaining center of sorts. They keep him in an unoccupied suite in a dorm on campus. I don't sleep well at all that night. The next morning, I get no update of what's going on. I'm looking over my shoulder every five seconds, and I'm absolutely terrified that he's loose and going to come after me. And then I get a call. He's not allowed out of the room. I have to answer more questions for another police officer. And they tell me what they learned from him. He'd begun his voyeuristic shenanigans by hiding the camera in one of his fraternity brother's rooms and managed to film him having sex. At this point, he went and hid the camera in the woman's bathroom and the bedrooms of his female students. I don't remember how many, but there were at least seven people filmed. They arrested him, and he was in jail for three days, then released to get his stuff and go to his hometown until they had the school trial. During this time, the school has to tell our staff team that he'll no longer be there for the rest of the year. They refused to tell the team what happened, or to let me tell anyone. They said it was so that he could leave with his dignity, as if he deserved it. Months go by, and after many meetings with assorted people, they have his trial. He's expelled. A year later, he has his legal trial with the state the school I attend is in. I was never informed of the results. I still need to call the police station, and this was a few months ago. However, I did receive a restraining order in the mail. Somewhere during this mess, I figured out how he got in my house and how he hid the camera. He got into my house because he had been granted key card access. I lived in a weird large house without key cards and not keys. He was granted this access because one of my residents needed help getting her stuff out for storage but it accidentally mailed her keys and keycard back home. Apparently, security thought the best way to handle this was to give him a keycard access to her house. He knew exactly when I wouldn't be in the house, because the night it was hidden, we had a staff meeting, and I told our group chat I would be leaving a few minutes early to pick up snacks. He knew where I was going, and that I wouldn't be home. It sickens me to think that before he hid that camera, We were laughing in rehearsal together, and after he did it, we were joking around at our staff meeting, just acting totally normal, as if he didn't just violate my privacy.